will be the human mic stand. So uh, uh, that's what that's what we only have one microphone. So that's what's happening here. Just wanted to explain. Um, so let, should we do introductions first, and then we'll jump yeah, in. No, so um, so I'm Pamela Chestek. Uh, I am an attorney from the United States. Uh, I'm Andrew Katz. Um, I'm a lawyer from the UK, um, and I advise a lot of free and open source software companies. Hi, uh, my name is Michaela McDonald, and I teach at university in London, Queen Mary. And what jurisdictions do you? Oh, yes, and I'll be looking at uh, civil law traditions in the EU. Um, so, one of, so I proposed this talk because, um, you know, we kind of, it's kind of this, always the, to me it's the elephant in the room is this, is it a license or a, a license or a contract? Are these open source licenses license or contracts? And it occurred, to, it finally occurred to me that the answer is probably different under um, different legal systems. And so I thought, well, why don't we figure out the answer to this question? And I'm happy to say that in putting together this panel and working with these panelists, it turns out the answer is really different in different jurisdictions. So I'm glad we did this little exercise. So I'm going to start with it. I'm going to start from a U.S. perspective, and then we'll do the U.K. perspective, and then we'll do, I'm sorry, the, the English, English perspective. English perspective. And, then, um, and then we'll do the EU perspective. So from the U.S. perspective, um, we have, there's this, um, a, a, a license is not, it's not a thing. It's a grant of permission to use a copyrighted material. And it can either be um, expressed, written, or oral, or it can be implied in conduct. Um, it is, and all it is, a license in the United States is simply a defense to an infringement. So if you are accused of infringement, you can say, I have a license, and as long as your behavior is within the scope of whatever that, whatever that expression is, whether it be written or whether it be oral or whether it be by conduct, as long as you can show your conduct fell within that, then you have a license defense and you're not an infringer. So in, a contract is a different concept altogether, and a contract is um, uh, a, an agreement between two people. It's, it requires an offer and acceptance and mutual consideration, meaning that both parties gain a benefit from this relationship. Now, it's, it is, has been established in the U.S. There's a little bit of jurisprudence in the U.S. It has been established that for open source licenses, this consideration for the, on the part of the offeror, on the part of the, of the licensor of the software, the benefits include um, generating market share for their programs, uh, increasing their national or international reputation, or improving a product. So, so from the licensor perspective in the U.S., that is consideration, that is the benefit for you granting this license. So what we have in the United States is you can, it, so this to me would be, and I'm using, the con, I'm using the word bare license because it is a term that's used sometimes. It's not really a term used in the United States or understood in the United States. But I would say that a bare license is simply an agreement for a license that has nothing else. Um, and then, you, but you can, typically a license is going to have a lot of different things going on. So the, the obviously, if you've, if you've gathered my analogy here, the yellow pepper is the copyright license. Um, but often the contract will have many other components to it, an agreement will have many other components. And in the U.S., what this turns on, the question then becomes, when you have this written document that has a lot of obligations in it, which ones of those are conditions of the license, meaning if you have not met those conditions, you don't have the copyright license, or which of them are, are, are other um, requirements within the agreement but, but not a condition on the license. So for, um, so for example, so an example of a condition uh, is there, the courts will look at words, and they'll look at words, and here you can see, um, you may, con so this is from the GPL, you may convey a work, uh, provided that you also meet all of these conditions. Well, that's pretty clearly stated what it is that's going to be the conditions for the copyright license. Um, an example of, of what, what might be a condition on a copyright license would be you may not create a derivative work contrasted with a covenant that is not part, which is maybe in the same agreement, but not part of, not a condition on the license would be you're not allowed to disparage um, the licensor. So that has nothing to do, so that may have nothing to do with the copyright grant. And so for, if, so again, back to if I fail to meet the conditions of my license, I'm a copyright infringer. But if I simply fail to meet a covenant, if I disparage that website owner, that may not affect the copyright license and is apart from the copyright license in this comprehensive document that may be mo that about more than just a copyright license. 
So um, in looking specifically at some licenses, I looked for the, the, the shortest license I could find, um, the one that I thought might be most what I could characterize as a bear license that really is just about copyright and nothing else. And I came up with, and the shortest one I could find is the fair license, which is this. Um, which just says clearly permission to use the work and then the disclaimer, the works are without warranty. And the next license I thought about was the th BSD 3 clause, which I'm not going to, which you can't read from that slide. The slides are all on the website, by the way. Um, and so in, under U.S. law, when I look at it, I think, okay, this concept of a bare license, is the fair license a bare license? Is it just about a copyright license and nothing else? I have question marks, maybe that extra warranty language, uh, that extra disclaimer language, maybe that isn't part of the copyright license, uh, but this is the only one that I would say might fit in that category, sort of bare license and not a contract. The BSD, the, the aspect of the BSD that I looked at and said, okay, well this is, this is uh, back to my concept of, of, of um, conditions or covenants, the BSD was, let me find the language, oh, the, uh, the um, the BSD, huh? Yeah, and you won't be able to read it, but yes. <laughs> there we go. Actually, thank you, because it was easier than finding my piece of paper. So number three, neither the name of the copyright holder nor the name of its contributors may be used to endorse or promote products derived from this software. I, that has, really has nothing to do with the copyright grant. Um, so I looked at that and thought that's probably a contractual condition, not a covenant. Uh, I'm sorry, a condition. Uh, it's not a condition of the, of the license grant that is a contractual covenant, and this then is agreement, a contract between two parties. So under U.S. law, I say fair license may be on the fair license, but basically they're all contracts. We really, I think we're going to have to save questions to the end because we have three people at very short time. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to come over here so I can press the button. So um, thanks, Pam. Uh -huh. uh, you're giving conventional okay? presentations. Let's do this. Oh, okay. I like being a human mic stand. Okay, let's hope, let's hope that works. Um, yeah, so I'm talking specifically about English law, which covers the law of England and Wales, um, and um, I'm assured by one of my Northern Irish colleagues that uh, the law is going to be interpreted the same in Northern Ireland as it is in England and Wales, uh, not Scotland. So we're not covering Scotland, which is much more of a, of a um, civil law jurisdiction. Um, so um, just um, when you look at the different sorts of contracts that we have, uh, a proprietary software license is typically a bilateral contract. Um, so that means that there are rights and obligations on both sides. Um, it means that um, it's the sort of complex contract that Pam was talking about, about earlier. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't really propose to, to analyze that much, uh, much further. Um, but um, uh, um, free and open source software um, contracts um, tend to fall into a different category. And if we look at what a bare license is from an English law perspective, it's basically a promise not to enforce rights that you may have, um, such as copyright. Um, but the problem is that if it's not enshrined in a contract that keeps it active, it means that the person making the promise is effectively able to withdraw it at any time, which makes it fairly useless for anyone relying on it. And the courts understood that this was a fairly unfair scenario. So they came up with the concept of estoppel that means that if somebody grants a license and then you rely on that license, then they're no longer allowed to revoke it. Um, it's slightly more complicated that, than that, but that, that's basically the, basically the, the, uh, the, the situation. Um, now, there is a halfway house here. Um, there is this concept of a unilateral contract. So uh, the sort of contract I mentioned before, bilateral contract is one where there are promises, mutual promises given on both sides. A unilateral contract is a contract where a promise is only given on one side, but the other party acts in such a way as to make it binding. And the classic example is this case with the wonderful name of Carlyle and the Carbolic Smoke um, Ball Company. Um, and basically the promise was uh, that um, they advertised that they would pay £100 to anyone who used their product um, and if they contracted the flu later. And this was very, very widely advertised. Um, so it was a Victorian case. Uh, that won't surprise anyone particularly. Um, so the Carbolic Smokeball Company advertised um, uh, that um, anyone who did get flu could get in touch with them and uh, they would be paid this hundred pounds. And this was, this was backed up by, they, they deposited a sum of money in a bank and they're obviously very, very serious about this. Um, now, 
Um, I haven't um, researched what the carbolic smoke ball is because um, I think I'd probably be disappointed with the reality. I always have in mind that it's like some sort of uh, toxic sm smoke grenade um, which is full of all sorts of noxious agents, possibly radium, this sort of thing. Uh, Miss, Mrs. Carlyle uh, was using this thing um, on, a, on a daily basis um, and um, on the upside... Um, these noxious, no, noxious agents failed to kill her. Um, on the downside, the noxious agents failed to kill the influenza virus, uh, and she caught influenza. Um, and probably even more unfortunately, they also failed to kill her husband, who happened to be a trial lawyer. Uh, so once she recovered uh, from, her, uh, from her influenza, um, uh, she started a court case um, against the carbolic uh, smoke uh, ball company. Um, and she won her hundred pounds, uh, which was a lot of money in those days. This was before the Brexit vote. So <laughs> the court case involved quite a lot of argument around offer and acceptance and communication and acceptance and offer and so on and so on and so forth. But the, the, the upshot of it was uh, that the court wanted to construct a mechanism by which Mrs. Carlyle had um, a, a means of effectively suing the smoke ball company to get the hundred pounds out of them. And this is basically why they invented this idea of the unilateral contract. So free software license is different. Um, so if Mrs. Carlo had been using software under the GPL, um, there are no circumstances in which she actually needs an enforceable right against the copyright owner. The only thing that could happen is that if she happens to be using the software within the scope of the GPL and the copyright owner tries to sue her for doing that, for copyright infringement, then she can put up a shield and say, no, I'm complying with these conditions, go away, you can't do this. So there aren't any circumstances in which she's going to initiate a claim. Um, now, uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that if Mrs. going back to the, the smoke ball example, if Mrs. Carlyle used her smoke ball incorrectly, uh, there's no way that the smoke ball company would have any claim against her. Um, for them, it would just be a shield against if she tried to claim the £100, they could say, no, you're not allowed the, the £100 because you didn't use the smoke ball every day as directed. Um, so there's no need for a contract. Uh, there's, and there's, there's, there's no need for a contract um, in the GPL example. So the fundamental question is, is it actually necessary to imply a contract? And the answer to that is no. And this is where I rely on an English case called Robin Ray and Classic FM, and I won't go into the, into the facts in any depth there. Um, but the court came to the conclusion that if it's going to Im be implying terms into contracts, it can only imply those terms to the extent that they're necessary and no more. So my argument is that surely that applies to contracts themselves. If you can obtain the full legal effect required without implying a contract at all, if the concept of bare license is sufficient to enable you to do that, then why do you need to imply a contract at all? So, um, really, looking, looking at the, the grid again, um, I mean, I um, sort of... Now, 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 now I'm actually prepared to be persuaded more slightly by Pam's <laughs> argument on the BSD. But I still think my, <laughs> now, now, now I think my, my argument still, still holds that each of those licenses can be interpreted in such a way that's entirely consistent with the concept of a bare license. Um, and there's no necessity uh, to imply a contract there. Uh, there are some question marks around GPL. Um, I think there should only be one question mark. I got a bit overexcited and put three in. Um, and uh, this is for the really sort of um, non-legal idea that the, the, there is obviously wording inside GPL that actually says um, uh, there's no need to accept this license, etc. It talks about acceptance. Uh, but it's almost the fact that it's, it's objecting so much that acceptance isn't required uh, that the court is bound to be awkward and say, well, actually, that means it probably is. But, um, you know, that's, that's just reference to the idiocy of judges, really. Um, so, that's it for English law. Um, now on to other jurisdictions. Do you want to pin that on or shall I hold it? Is that better? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Right. So, um, just to go um, or sort of focusing on um, the main differences between US, English, and the civil law tradition. 
Um, I'll be talking about civil law tradition in general, looking at the EU. Obviously, there are a multitude of different legal systems, and there is no scope to go into all of them uh, in detail. So I'm just focusing on some general legal principles. Um, um, and basically, the main difference is that software licenses, proprietary or uh, false, would be interpreted as contracts. There is no such an independent uh, concept of, of bare license or of a specific uh, legal category that would apply uh, to um, open source uh, licenses. Uh, the license itself, therefore, needs to meet all the relevant contractual uh, legal uh, requirements. We would be looking at offer and acceptance, the main difference between uh, common and civil law principles is that in civil law, the focus is on the party's obligations rather than on the party's promises like it is in common law. Uh, that is why you would have uh, the option of um, both unilateral and bilateral contracts where your unilateral will would create obligations that would be enforceable. So again, the idea of donation or gift creating an enforceable contract. Uh, but in this um, specific context, we would look at whether all the uh, requirements are there. The license, again, would be seen as an agreement where the licensor grants the licensee um, permission to perform certain acts that goes sort of beyond the copyright. Um, and when sort of looking at the different licenses, whether there is a concept of uh, bare license, or whether it is a contract, again, the answer is it is a contract. There are a number of cases, uh, especially in Germany, that sort of tested the validity and enforceability of uh, clauses under the GPL. Um, and the court has confirmed in both cases. Um, one was the, uh, for example, the Welte versus Sitecom uh, Deutschland GmbH, and the other one also involved uh, Welte and Dealing Germany, uh, where the court has confirmed that these clauses are enforceable, um, enforceable under copyright, and uh, are valid. In terms of, um, again, the Oh, there are some slides missing. I didn't. I thought there were more of the grids, you know, comparing. We do. The... We'll do those next. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, okay. We can go there. We can go there. But yeah, we can go there if you're ready to talk about them. So, so we also there are some additional slides that we won't have time to go through individually. Can you just speak into the oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So there are some individual slides. Um, uh, the disclaimer, you know, we could we could be wrong because we this is just individual opinions of individual lawyers. But just some very quick slides, um, and just jump in if you want to say something. So, um, so just we have this sort of taxonomy of you know bare license, unilateral contract, bilateral contract. Some basic facts about each of those under the legal system. So you can see under the EU there is no such thing as a bare license. Um, we, are, they, are these revocable or not uh, is one of the slides. As I said, these are on the website, so you're welcome to pull these slides down. Um, which concept in particular were you, did you want to? Um, I just want to say that obviously the difference, but, yes, um, then the difference in the interpretation would lead to different legal effects. So as it is a contract, there would have to be certain elements present. You would be looking at whether uh, there was an offer, whether there was an acceptance. Again, civil law does not hang on to the concept of consideration, so that is not relevant, but requires uh, other formalities, whether the license for, oh, sorry, the contract was uh, agreed for legal purpose, whether the party was capable of entering into a contract, and so forth. Um, and uh, you would be looking at whether, for example, in the licensing chain, all these formalities have been met, whether it is possible sometimes, to identify all the relevant parties in the licensing chain and therefore there has been a valid contract concluded. So that would be the difference between looking at uh, the license agreement from the perspective of a bare license or a contract, from the perspective of common law or civil law as to the legal effects that the contract would have.
Yeah, so just some summary slides here. So we had, so a third party beneficiary is can a user enforce this contract, particularly for the GPL, so the person who has not received the source code, who should have received the source code, is that person able to make a claim that they're entitled to it? Does this contract allow that? That's one concept that's uh, very interesting. Um, specific performance means can you get the, the, the licensee who has not performed, can you oblige them to perform, or instead can you simply um, force them to pay damages for their non-compliance? What remedy is available? Specific performance being, as it sounds, performance versus just a payment of damages. And the uh, legal costs, whether or not the... Um, the which party may be whether a party may be entitled to recover their legal costs also a contract concept and um, excluding liability whether it's legally feasible and possible sometimes one is not allowed to exclude liability and so these are so again sorry that we don't have time to go through all of these concepts but they are uh, they are there for you to look at and uh, we have I think four minutes for questions first hand yeah Yeah, so, um, I'll get, so the question was, can I give a walkthrough on why I believe that the third paragraph of the BSD is a covenant and not a condition? So that's a very narrow, so it's a narrow reading. So part of it is sort of the structure of the license. It doesn't use the sort of magic language. The second is that there is some law in the United States that says that conditions have to apply specifically to the copyright grant. So um, not to use a name in advertising has nothing to do with copyright whatsoever. So some courts may interpret that and say, therefore, it's a condition, not a, it's therefore a covenant, not a condition. Second question, yep. Um, the, the precise difference between the BSD 3 clause and the BSD 2 clause license is that. Yes, <laughs> that's so why I picked the three. <laughs> Um, so again, to the extent that bare license, so th again, this is, oh, sorry. The question is, so the difference between the BSD 2 clause and the 3 clause was exactly that paragraph that I, that, uh, that I cite to, which is why I used the 3 clause as an example. And the question is, is the BSD 2 clause a bare license? Again, back to that's really not a concept under U.S. law that, you know, so, so are, is that, you know, are all of those conditions of the copyright grant possibly? You also have the disclaimer of warranty, which may affect it too. I think most courts would just look at it and say it's a contract and and you know the fair the fair the fair license was the only one that I could kind of look at and say there's really nothing there but the copy but discussion of the copyright grant another question uh Jelaine yeah so I uh, So, so let me let me clear. So the question is, isn't it both? And the answer is yes. It's always both. So, to so the extent that to the extent that a contract contains a copyright license, then it is both. Now, the difference is if what has ha if I've breached my license. So remember, it's a defense. So that if I don't meet the conditions for the defense to say I'm not an infringer. I am an infringer, and, I, and therefore the licensor may be entitled to copyright damages. Um, if, the, if, the breach of the license, if the breach of the agreement is unrelated to the copyright license, I may not be in breach of the license. I may still have the copyright defense, but my offense is something else related to the contract. Say, for example, I disparaged you then I'm entitled to my contract remedy for um, disparagement. So you can recover both types of remedies under the agreement. You just can't have duplicative recovery. Um, let me see. Let me get, I'm going to do this question here. Yes. So um, this is a question about the English rules. Yes. So, um, the GPL in particular um, states quite clearly that its purpose is to secure certain rights for everybody, particularly downstreams of the licensee. Um, now, obviously, it's also got this language in it which tries to make it very much clear that just a bare license. Yeah. Um, is it possible that you might be able to persuade the court to read the GPL purposively and say that the source code of these provisions were intended to be enforceable by a downstream? 
Right. Okay, so to summarise the question, um, so as far as the GPL is concerned, um, then uh, its stated intention is to se secure rights for users of the software. Um, and um, the reality is that's contained in the preamble, so I think we'd, we'd agree that's some non-contractual part. So the question is, would the courts interpret that purposively um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to try to um, uh, create a situation where um, licensees are able to enforce. So um, any recipient of the software, for example, um, could claim um, against um, somebody upstream who wasn't providing the source code, um, for example, to do that. Um, my personal um, view is that's difficult to do. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting argument. Part of the problem is that there's a number of different ways um, of complying. Um, and in order to get specific performance, um, the court is going to have to choose you know, what mode of compliance is the appropriate one. Um, and um, I don't think any court is ever going to want to do that. Um, so uh, courts are very, very uncomfortable about, um, uh, about applying the specific performance anyway. And if you're going to look at a purposive approach, which is something that um, is fairly alien to English courts anyway, it's much more of a civil law concept, um, then you would bring in the whole of the concept of the, you know, the Free Software Foundation's view that it's only the copyright holders that should be able to um, enforce rather than the, uh, rather than, than the recipients of the software. Um, I think it'd be, it'd be a slightly sort of scary concept, I think, if the recipients were able to enforce, but there's a possibility that, you know, under German law, as I understand it, there's a possibility that that you know, might happen in Germany, but it's less likely to happen in England, I think. Um, I think Jim's, Jim had his hand up, or do you want to cede your question? No, I want to hear Jim's question. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make sure I understand it. So you're saying someone hasn't com complied with the license. Someone fails to comply. Yeah. Someone fails to comply. Can, can I now claim? That the license is revoked. That's, you know, that's a really fascinating question that we actually discussed at dinner last night. <laughs> and, and, I will, and I will commend you to, um, what was the case I was just reading? Oh, Artifact Software, which actually does have a discussion on the automatic. This is I, I sort of thrust is the automatic termination versus termination versus, I don't know if that's, but that, uh, um, I would, so if, if we're just putting, so we're just talking about the conditions to the copyright license. We're not talking about the contract. We're just talking about the license. <sighs> so, <laughs> I'm just going to stick to the license. So, um, so I, I do think I do think that um, if you I do think that if if you are meeting the conditions. So to me, I look at it and say, Am I meeting the conditions of the license? Do I have the defense? Now, it doesn't say yesterday was I meeting them. It is at the time I am accused, do I have a defense and am I in compliance with those conditions? And that's, that to me seems like yes or no. So I can come into I could have been out of compliance, but I wasn't accused of infringement at that point in time, so it was a moot point. It only matters when I'm accused of infringement at that point in time, am I in compliance or not? I don't know if that, has that answered your question? I put a fine point on it. You want to? <laughs> The license has terminated. Um, that's yeah. So the question is, can you say that the license is revoked due to this um, non-compliance? That's a question of state law, which will vary from state law from from state to state. What are the opportunities? When are the, what are the what are the situations under which one can terminate an agreement? So yeah.